As always, we are truly thrilled with those who are visiting us this morning. We thank you for your presence, and we hope and pray that <clears throat> uh, if you have not yet done so, you'll be willing to share <clears throat> your contact information with us so that together we can continue to forge those bonds of friendship and fellowship between us. So our brethren, thank you for being here this morning. Thank you for making sure to uh, comply with the commandments of our God as we rejoice together in this spiritual feast by worshiping the mighty himself, uh, the almighty himself in spirit and in truth. Please open your Bibles to the book of Proverbs chapter 3. <clears throat> The book of Proverbs, chapter 3, and as you're turning there, we're going to be reading from verses 13 through 15, and as I was saying, as you turn there, I want to add one more announcement. Uh, let's keep our brother Frank in our prayers. Uh, he was telling me earlier this morning that he will be having a uh, eye surgery on the 5th of November. Uh, so let's remember our brother Frank. Uh, he's here sitting in the front. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, let's pray for the brother so that that procedure, of course, will be um, a successful one, I believe, is to try to remove some of the pressures, what he was explaining, from his eyes. So let's uh, remember our brother in our prayers. Uh, Proverbs chapter 3, beginning at verse 13. Happy is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding. For her proceeds are better than the profits of silver, and her gain the fine gold. She is more precious than the rubies, and all the things you may desire cannot compare, <clears throat> cannot compare with her. Will you please bow with me in prayer? Our Heavenly Father and our beloved God, hallowed be thy name. Father, we call upon thy sacred name, and we do so in a spirit of humility but we do so with joy and with reverence. We thank you, Father, for another day of life in which we have been blessed by you to be able, Father, to assemble as thy saints, to be able to worship thee in spirit and in truth, to be able, Father, to sing praises unto thee and to give back a small portion of the many blessings that you have given us, to have the opportunity to remember that precious sacrifice of Jesus, thy Son, who, Father, as a lamb without spot and without blemish, gave his life for our salvation and for our redemption. We truly are grateful, Father, for these blessings. And as we now come to this portion of worship where we seek to, seek to search thy scriptures together, be with this thy servant. Allow me, Father, to share that which I've been able to glean from thy holy scriptures. But, Father, most of all, grant me the strength and the boldness so that I may apply in my daily living, so that I, Father, may be able to uh, put in my life this example, Father, so that my words may always, Father, uh, be shadowed by my actions. Father, once more, thank you for these many blessings. Forgive us for our sins, and we pray in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Happy is the man who finds wisdom. Happy is the man who gains understanding. We have been speaking about the admonitions that you and I can take from the life of King Solomon. We've been discussing so far as we've begun, uh, only three weeks in, if you will, if I'm not mistaken, into this uh, series of studies, about how this man established his kingdom in a wise manner. We saw how he surrounded himself with a royal court that helped him not only gain this kingdom, but in it, was included the Almighty Himself. We left a bit of a preview last week as we said that today we were going to be discussing about Solomon's request to God. But it is important that we establish first and foremost some very, very important uh, truths about what we're going to see this morning. You see, we've, named, we've titled our lesson A Wise Selection because indeed when you and I go to 1 Kings chapter 3, we see there that God approaches Solomon. And we see that the first thing that we must understand when we go to 1 Kings chapter 3 is that the reason God approached Solomon was to give him the opportunity to ask for whatever it is that he desired. God, as we've stated before, was testing his king. 
God was now testing Solomon's heart to see where his mind in actuality was. But not only was God testing Solomon, we see that God was actually giving Solomon the right to make a choice and that whatever Solomon would have asked for, God would have given it to him just as he would have asked. You see, remember that Solomon's other name was Jedediah, the beloved of Jehovah, the beloved of the Lord. And in this chapter, we see why Solomon was beloved by God. In this chapter, we are able to see why God loved this, this uh, being, this servant of his, as much as he did. In fact, go with me to chapter 3, verse 10, and notice that there we see why this man was special for God. The Bible says, the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. But that's for tonight. This morning, you and I were going to discuss why his selection was wise. In other words, how did Solomon come to realize what he needed to ask from God? Notice that at the beginning of the chapter in chapter 3, we see that Solomon had offered God an offering, a burnt offering, so lavish and so splendid because he was showing his gratitude for God establishing his kingdom as firmly as he did. We see that the first thing that Solomon does is that he is preparing himself to be God's loyal servant. And thus when he does this, when he shows his gratitude, we see that it is, that it is then and it is when God appears to him, chapter 3 verse 5, after having accepted that offering that Solomon had offered to him. Brethren, you know it's interesting that we always think about Solomon's wisdom coming after the prayer, but truth be told, Solomon was already displaying wisdom before God gave him an opportunity to ask. The fact that Solomon was able to make a wise selection proves to us that God was, in, was showing his love and favor for this servant because this man had taken to heart the law of his mother and the instruction of his father. In fact, David, when he speaks to Solomon, we see that David himself explains to Solomon and he acknowledges and tells him, You are wise, my son. Do according to mine enemies, according to your wisdom. Solomon, brethren, already had wisdom within himself. Solomon had already received from his parents the training from his teachers, like Zadok the priest. He had received that kind of training already. Solomon was not some man who did not have any kind of knowledge. He was not a man that did not have any kind of understanding. But rather, Solomon was able to recognize where it was that he lacked. You see, when God came and approached Solomon to ask him and to tell him in verse 5, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night and God said, Ask, what shall I give you? Solomon was already thinking about this. His mind was already pondering on what he would ask, on what it was that he needed, what it was that he required in order to be an effective king. Now remember, when we first began this series of lessons, we saw what had to be the mindset of Solomon as he was stepping into his father's shadow. He had to realize that these shoes that he was about to fill were no small shoes. But he also understood the gravity and the weight of what his crown now had. He had to preserve, he had to protect his father's work, and especially knowing that he had the very, very large task of building the temple of God. So you see, brethren, the wise selection, how Solomon came to this conclusion, starts by first acknowledging that Solomon was not ignorant. It does not mean that Solomon was void of wisdom when he asked from God. It does not mean that Solomon had no knowledge or no understanding whatsoever. Because once more, we've pointed out three examples. We pointed out that David acknowledges his wisdom. We pointed out that God loved him because he was a man that without a doubt had displayed this wisdom before. And the fact that Solomon was not taking this responsibility lightly 
shows that Solomon had some wisdom. So then what exactly was Solomon's request to God? Why was it such a wise selection? Go with me, if you will, very quickly to uh, the first letter to the Thessalonians. You know, I want to show you something very, very interesting that we find here. First Thessalonians chapter 4. And, and we're just using this as a way of an illustration. And we're just using this as a way of trying to give us a parallel or an idea as to what was what is our first point in this lesson, okay? Now remember, we've established that Solomon had wisdom. Solomon had knowledge. Solomon had understanding. Therefore, we must first understand what exactly it is that Solomon asked for. When God gave him an opportunity to ask, Notice Solomon's mindset in the light of what Paul instructs the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning at verse 9. But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. And indeed, you do so toward all the brethren who are in all Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more. Now pay attention to what we're doing here as far as a reference that helps us explain what exactly Solomon asked for. God, through, through Paul's pen, is teaching us that the Thessalonian brethren, that the church in Thessalonica, had no need to be taught in regards to love. They, says the Bible, had already practiced this love, the brotherly love. They had displayed and exhibited it, verse 10, toward all the brethren in Macedonia. In fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, we see the kind of love that Paul is referring to. This was a church in the midst of a city that had been plagued by civil war. And because of that civil war, poverty had struck. They were not a wealthy congregation. They were very limited as far as their financial resources. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, as Paul points to the churches in Macedonia, meaning Thessalonica was one of them, as an example to the church in Corinth, he says and he exalts them by saying that they gave beyond their means. That they gave from their deep poverty. And thus that proves here in 1 Thessalonians 4 9, what Paul meant when he said, you don't need me to teach you about brotherly love, you have taught me about it. But just because they didn't need to be taught about it, it did not mean that they did not have room to grow in it. You see that? Just because they possessed it did not mean that they could not develop it even more. Notice verse 10. The, the commandment given by them. He says, but we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more. Don't become complacent. Don't become comfortable with the level of love. You can still learn how to love more. You can still learn how to give more, how to do more, to love in other ways that perhaps you didn't think about before. This is Solomon's request. Solomon already was wise. Solomon already had knowledge. But Solomon understood that the wisdom that he possessed could always increase more and more. What Solomon was requesting for was, increase my wisdom, O God. Allow me to, as we would say in our modern vernacular, to level up for you. Yes, I've been wise at this juncture of my life, and I've been wise as far as the decisions that I have to make in my personal life, and as to I, whom I choose to marry, but now I'm at a completely different level. I've never ruled a kingdom before. I've never led a mass kingdom like yours. I've never been in the position that my father's been. I am completely out of my depth right now. Help me grow. Help me increase my wisdom. Help me expand upon what you have already given me, O oh Father. 
You see, brethren, the disciples often made the plea to our master, increase our faith. The Thessalonians, by the Apostle Paul, are urged, increase your love more and more. Brethren, as Christians, we must never become complacent or comfortable with what we already have. We must always try to increase more and more. We must always be grateful for what we do have, but understand that we can still go further with what we have done already. Especially when it pertains to the business of our God, and when it pertains to the kingdom of our God, when we are now asked to step up to the plate, when we are now asked to step in and take over for a responsibility that requires taking and overseeing for a mass amount of people in the kingdom of God, we should not think that we are already fully prepared, especially if we've never done it. Think about the time you became a mother or a father for the first time. You probably had read the books. You probably had been given the advice. You probably had been warned by many seasoned parents. But it still made you feel that you needed more. That you still weren't completely, fully prepared or trained. And thus wisdom is selected when you make this decision to ask God, please increase. Please help me develop even more because I've never been a father. I've never been a husband. Please, Father, help me grow so that I can be an effective father, so that I can be an effective husband, so that I can be an effective leader of my household. Solomon as Proverbs 3, 13 through 15, made the wise selection because he understood his limitations. You see, wisdom begins to manifest itself when we show humility and meekness. Those people who refuse to learn because they believe that they know everything, they are described by the book of Proverbs as fools. Proverbs chapter 1 verse 7b calls them fools because they despise instruction. Because they reject the teaching. They believe that they don't have any need of it because they already have it. They've already obtained it. And notice how they are becoming their own worst enemy by thinking that way. They limit themselves from the potential of growing even more. You know, a few years back, I remember mentioning this, and I remember uh, a couple of people came up to me, want, some because they had never heard what I said, and others because they perhaps were a little confused and wanted a little more of clarity. But I remember making the statement, and I stand firm by this, our elders still have room for growth. And, and I wasn't referring to just our elders here, but I'm referring to elders everywhere. Just because they have been placed as overseers of a congregation doesn't mean that they can no longer grow. Does not mean that they do not have room to learn. If our eldership or a eldership ever thinks, well, I'm an elder now, I've made it, there's nothing more that I can do, that man should be removed. Because Solomon was wise. He had achieved the crown. He had a wise counselors as his royal court. And Solomon, when God asked him, what shall I do for you? Father, I am ignorant. I still got more to learn. Give me wisdom. Notice the humility of Solomon. David, his father, had acknowledged his wisdom. And yet Solomon is saying, I am not wise. He acknowledged his limitation. But not only did he acknowledge his limitation, it was not beneath him to grow. It was never beneath him to grow. Brethren, if we live our lives as true students of the Bible, then we will never be masters and we will always be disciples of Christ. Because we can always grow. 
we can always learn. You know, this Tuesday I have the blessing, if our God allows it, to go to uh, participate and teach the little children of the STICE program, the South Texas Institute of Christian Education. It's a homeschool program that has been prepared by a member of the Lord's Church. And this program I get to work with anywhere from first graders to third graders to middle schoolers. And I remember the first time I had to teach in this program, realizing, wait a minute, I've never taught children before. What makes me qualified to teach children? What I didn't expect is that they were going to teach me. With their innocent questions. That they probably don't understand the extent of what they're asking, but I came to realize, wow, an un contaminated mind will ask you the deepest questions of the Bible. There's nothing like looking at the Bible through the eyes of an innocent child that only wants to know. But what if I would have gone in there saying, I'm the adult, you're the children, you all learn from me because I have nothing to learn from you. What blessings I would have denied myself. You know, we're about to look for teachers. Those of you who have never done it before, stop denying yourself that blessing. Find out how, bless, how much of a blessing is. There's a reason that those who are now teaching are always wanting to teach. I bet you they've grown more when they've taught than when they sat in my class, especially my class. You see, Solomon understood that he had limitations, that he didn't know everything. Not only did he understand that he could always grow, he understood that there was a lot that he didn't understand yet. And because he understood this, he knew what to ask for. He knew what to look for because he had been thinking about it. And look at the humility in the way that Solomon was thinking about it. The humility of his mindset wasn't in, okay, when I'm king, I'm going to tear down my father's buildings and I'm going to rebuild them greater. No, Solomon's mindset was, how am I going to finish my father's business? And how am I going to rule effectively God's chosen nation? How am I going to do this? If you will go with me to Jeremiah chapter 1. Notice the humility of this prophet of God when he is called into his service. Jeremiah chapter 1. Beginning there at verse 4, Jeremiah chapter 1, beginning at verse 4, Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Then, I, then said I, Ah, oh, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am a youth, for you shall go. Excuse me, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Brethren, Jeremiah was scared. So was Solomon. On November 15, 2015, I was scared. Even today, October 27, 2024, even before having to come up these few feet up here, I was still scared, and I'm always scared. Not because of the audience, but because of the great king that I'm serving. Notice Jeremiah had the same mindset. In comparison to you, God, in your service, I am a youth, I am a child. How can I be effective for you? What kind of knowledge level do I have that you would use? And God had to tell Jeremiah, it's not about that, Jeremiah. It's not about what you know, what you understand, or how well you know it. It's simply about you doing what I command you to do and you speaking what I tell you to speak. But notice the compassion in God's voice in verse 8. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. 
Don't be intimidated, Jeremiah. Don't be scared. You're not alone. I'm not sending you in blind, and I'm not sending you in without direction, and I'm not asking you to come up with it all on your own. I'm going to be there with you every step of the way. I'm going to be directing you, but not only am I going to be directing you, I'm going to deliver you. When Solomon asked of God, increase my wisdom, help me grow, help me develop and become even more, multiply what you've already granted me, O oh God. For this nation is a great nation like the sands of the sea. For this kingdom that you have given me is immense in number. And like Jeremiah, Solomon was echoing the words of, I am a child wearing a crown. And God responded by telling Solomon, because you have asked for wisdom, not for wealth, not for long life, but for wisdom. I will grant it to you, but with it, I will also grant you what you did not ask for. That was God telling Solomon, don't be scared. I am with you. I will deliver you. And I'm going to guide you and train you in how to rule my people effectively. Brethren, fear can sometimes stagnate us. Terror can sometimes limit us and pigeonhole us. You see, it isn't wrong to be afraid. It isn't wrong to feel that intimidation or to feel that sense of dread in the moment, especially when the responsibility is so great. But what God declares to us in that moment is, ask, what shall I give you? You see, when God has placed us in these positions of responsibility, He's not just putting the crown upon us, and He's not just laying the burden upon us without even offering to help us. But like Solomon, once He has given us the crown, once He has set upon us, firmly what our responsibility is going to be, immediately he follows it up with, what shall I give you? I want you to succeed. I want you to carry out my task. I want you to do it because this is why I chose you. But tell me, what is holding you back from doing it? What do I have to do to help? What must I give you to make sure that you do so? Speak to me. Ask. What shall I give you? Notice God is not denying what we need. God is telling us, whatever you need, just ask. And I will deliver it. Go with me to James chapter 4. Notice, brethren, that many times we think we're asking wisely. Many times we think that our request is the right one. But notice what the Bible says there in James chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that you war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and, you fly, you fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive, because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Father, please, please, Lord, let me win the lottery. Father, all I'm asking is for the newest Lamborghini. Father, as I register for my wedding, let someone give me a new house. Those things can come afterward. Instead, Father, grant me wisdom and surround me with those wise and godly husbands and wives who can teach me and advise me on how I can be a godly husband to that beautiful woman. 
Father, surround me with wise counselors. Surround me with godly men so that they can help me become a more effective evangelist for your kingdom. Father, grant me not only the strength, but grant me also the guidance so that when the time comes to defend your kingdom from the ungodliness of sin, that I may not only be bold, but I may also be merciful and loving with the sinner. You see, many times we ask God, fix the problem. But Solomon didn't ask God, fix the problem. Solomon asked God, teach me how I can solve the problem. Teach me how I can learn how to do it for myself so that I will not always have you do it for me, Father. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss, says James. Solomon received because when he asked, he did not ask foolishly. He asked wisely. He was already a wise man. But Solomon knew my wisdom is very limited for what I'm supposed to do. Solomon, although wise, was a humble man. He acknowledged that through his humility that he was limited and he would not be able to be an effective king like his father was. And therefore when Solomon asked, we see that Solomon did not ask for God to solve the problem, but rather he asked God to teach him how to do it for himself. What are we praying for, brethren? You know, how are we answering God's question? You see, when, when we are given an opportunity, when an opportunity presents itself before us, you know, for those of our brothers who have been faithful Christians their whole lives, and they have faithful Christian women as their wives and have raised their home and governed their home well and have faithful, uh, faithful children who are obedient to them and have been examples that people would go to them because of their godliness. You see, to you, God is calling you and telling you, I need you as a shepherd in my kingdom. But do we cower away from the opportunity because, like Jeremiah, we say, I am a youth. I, I'm, not, I'm not the best. Like Moses, are we like Moses who comes up with so many excuses because our terror stagnates us? Or should we be more like Solomon? That if our God is showing us clearly... I'm choosing you for this responsibility. I'm putting upon you this task. Ask, what shall I give you? What do you need to be a wise, godly overseer of my fold? What do you need to be a faithful steward of my kingdom? God wants us to triumph, brethren. He does not want us to fail. This is how we get rid of the dread, and this is how we conquer the fear. That if that blessing and that responsibility is offered to us, that then God is calling us to the plate. This morning, my friend, if you've been here more than once, it's because you know, you know that there's something missing in your life. And the fact that you know that there's something missing in your life shows that you already possess some form of wisdom. Perhaps it is not the full developed godly wisdom, but you have some semblance of it. You have the beginning embers of that wisdom. But God is asking you, what shall I give you? What can I do so that you can gain and earn your salvation today? Ask, what do you need in order to be obedient to the gospel this morning? Do you need a Bible study? 
There are faithful Christians here who are ready to do it. God has provided it. Do you have questions and doubts? God has given us his word where we can answer those doubts together. Do you need someone to go up here, come up here with you because you're afraid of doing it alone? Or do you just simply need to be with a few people because you feel that too many people would be too much pressure? What do you need? Because to you, God says, ask. What shall I give you so that you can secure your salvation this morning? God wants you, friend, to triumph. God wants to make you this morning more than a conqueror. You simply have to ask for the right thing. You see, we have a bit of a challenge right now. Because this is usually the part where I say, here is water. What hinders you? Well, we may not have water here, but there's plenty of water elsewhere. That is not going to stop us from helping you reach your salvation this morning. You see, we've asked, and we've gotten our solution. But now we ask you, will you put on Christ in baptism this morning? Christians, fellow Christians, our throne has been firmly established by God. Our throne has been firmly secured by our older brother, Jesus Christ. As Christians, we are now being placed in positions to rule and govern our lives and our homes. But we are to also contribute to the kingdom of heaven. If you have not yet been growing, or if you have become complacent, to you, God asks, what shall I give you to get you out of your comfort zone? You see, David on CISO doesn't realize that when God asked him that question, he wanted motivation and God gave it to him in the form of a little hammer known as Obed Pineda. Because he always gives me credit for something that I really did not do. But David wanted to grow. So God sent him a pesky, persistent hunter and boy. But he's grown. You see that? And I can say the same about many members of this blessed congregation. I've been blessed to grow with you. But are we asking for the right thing? Are we asking for God to help us learn how to do it for ourselves? Or are we asking God to do it for us? This morning, if you would want to grow, if you want to ask like Solomon, know that by making that selection, you're already showing wisdom on your behalf because you're acknowledging that you want to increase, but you're also acknowledging the limitations of what you already have. And we are ready to help you. We are ready to be the agents of God to make that happen by praying with you, by praying for you, by encouraging you, and by studying together God's word to find the answers to whatever questions you need asked this morning. But if you go home with those questions and you choose not to answer God's question, then do not say that God did not answer your prayer and accept and acknowledge that you did not like the answer that he gave. If there's anyone this morning who wants to accept God's offer and is ready to answer his loving call of salvation, we encourage you to come forward as we stand and we sing.